out this way, but this is where this is the direction it took once I started down a path. I was looking at something else, kind of unrelated, but I, I uh, was reminded that the last few weeks we had spoke, at least last week specifically, about the chapter uh, that Jesus gave from the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. And I said for the sake of time, we could divide those, uh, that, uh, those two chapters, three chapters, 5, 6, 7, up into three parts, but we wouldn't have time but to address one. And so last week we talked about the Beatitudes, and this week I'm going to skip the similitudes and go straight to the commandments and, uh, and talk again about the Sermon on the Mount. I, I, I just really think that it's a, uh, it's a understanding that's vital for us as Christians to mature spiritually, to get a hold of what it was in truth that Christ was conveying to his disciples, to us, his church, in those chapters. And over the uh, several thousand years of expounding on that chapter, uh, those teachers, as the, those, you know, all meant to be, all meant good, I'm sure. But they've, uh, they've had different interpretations for the meaning of those verses in those three chapters. And I've, I've listed four of them that you probably can relate to as probably having had or heard these words of Christ addressed as to meaning this. Number one, uh, that this, these beatitudes and these similitudes and these this, uh, standards of life uh, are demanded by Jesus Christ are, are, are for the lost world to be saved. That's a lot of, I have heard over the years that, that when men have taught on these chapters that that is the approach they took, that this Sermon on the Mount was meant to, as the way for the lost to become saved. And then two, uh, the second thing that I've heard is this is the way the lost Israel to be saved, that the Lord on the Sermon on the Mount was speaking to the nation of Israel. And then three, uh, one approach and one interpretation by many in Christendom is that this is just a, a really a nice moral code by which all men should aspire to live. That's probably the most popular I, that I've heard. And then four, this is the state of spirituality that those who are born again shall stand in the coming kingdom. That one is also, uh, all, as all of them, they defer the real true meaning. Each one of those four interpretations defer the truth. Uh, they, 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 they push it off. They push it away. Uh, what is presented in truth uh, is the true interpretation in the light of the new covenant. That is that the entire Sermon on the Mount was teaching by Jesus Christ on the standard of righteousness required of the born again, regenerated believer, in order that one might inherit a place in the coming kingdom of heavens. This totally went over the top of the head of many who might have been listening uh, in online and different places. They just have no idea what I just said. What was it that he just said? Uh, it didn't make a bit of sense to me. So I'll repeat it. The true interpretation of this Sermon on the Mount was Jesus Christ giving a standard of righteousness to those that have been born again that they might, in order that they might, inherit a place in the coming kingdom of heavens. And now this group knows what I mean when I say the kingdom of heavens or when the word of God says the kingdom of heavens. When Christ revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of heavens, he meant the millennial kingdom of ruling and reigning as the bride with him in the heavenly place. So this Sermon on the Mount addresses those standards, that standard of righteousness that we might inherit to that kingdom, that coming kingdom. We qualify while we're alive, and uh, we'll find out whether we qualified or not 
at the time Christ returns. That will be the, the presentation of, of whether or not we had qualified with the standard of righteousness that he conveys to us here in these three chapters. The sermon could be broken down into these three parts. The righteousness is shown as maturing process within the believer in the Beatitudes. I spoke about that and gave some, hopefully some insight uh, last week as how it progressively moves from blessed are the poor in the spirit to those that mourn, to those that are meek, and to those that are hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I think that you could follow those scriptures in a progression of growth, spiritual growth. Poor in spirit, meaning you were poor in spirit and then you were born again. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit that are born again. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the, the possibility. You, without, without the poor of spirit, recognition of the poor of spirit, the coming unto Christ, being born again, receiving him in the atonement, in the justifying redemption part of it, there would be no possibility to inherit in the kingdom of heavens. And then from there, uh, we, we expounded on those beatitudes. And then the second part that we talked about could have been, um, these three chapters could be divided up into, is that dynamic and reflective spiritual state comparative to salt and light. When he says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the earth. These, these we call the similitudes. These are similar in nature to Christ. That's brought about through the progression of spirituality that's reflected in the Beatitudes. And then thirdly, a list of commandments and standards demanded by Jesus Christ of his followers. And this is really what the remaining two chapters, the almost two and a half chapters are dedicated to these commandments of Jesus Christ. Or standards that are demanded by him. Uh, of his followers, which we've noted before several times, and often, I suppose, that far exceed those of Moses' law. The law of Moses pales in comparison to the demands and commands of Jesus Christ. And he owns Mosaic law when he says, it is written, but I say. But it is written, I say, but I say. He owns Moses' law by making those statements. He supersedes it. He fills Moses' law with meaning in himself. He takes upon himself to speak words, not only adding to the Mosaic law, but filling them with meaning. And the word says, at the end of the seventh chapter, it's the last verse or so in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, what he was teaching, what he was saying. And it is astounding. You can imagine the ears. Uh, if I brought you a message today that was so articulate, so, so different from anything that you ever heard before, you, you, would, you would be astounded. You would you'd be astonished at what? How? You know, this is something really different. And of course, coming from him, being who he was, it, it had the power of resonating with them. It wasn't just words. It, there was power there behind those words. And they, and they said, he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So in other words, it wasn't that the scribes were meek. They were autocratic. You know, they were dominating, domineering. But it was something different about him. It was from like as he had authority to say these things, a, a divine authority. It wasn't some kind of presumed or appointed authority because they were scribes under the Pharisee law or under the law of Moses. Uh, it was uh, something that was astonishing. And they said to themselves, uh, what, what great demands, what, what kind of great demands this man has put on us 
and with what great authority he has demanded them. It's as if he had the authority to demand us to do these things that he has commanded. That was what was astonishing to them. It's one, it's one thing for a crazy person that everyone knows is crazy to be spouting stuff that no one would pay any attention to or take not to heart with another thing with a man with great merit and it was perceived to be a prophet at the very least to be espousing things that were far beyond uh, any kind of accountability that they had been confronted with by the scribes. And that he is demanding of them. And it's not the loss that he here is speaking to, as we know in the first few verses of chapter 5, it's the disciples that he's speaking to. He called unto himself his disciples. And he said these things to his disciples, and it was his disciples who were astonished. Wow, how can he say these things with such great authority? Well, it, it is with that in mind that we peruse the whole three chapters. And we don't take verse by verse, nor do we take one verse out of context and apply it some way, you know, religiously. We take the whole Sermon on the Mount and we look for the, over, the oversight, the keys, the, the main parts of what it is that Christ is is, is conveying to his disciples. And what we see is what we have listed here as the real truth of the matter. And that is that Christ is, holds forth a righteousness of his followers. He demands a certain type of righteousness that bring, would bring them, if they were to hold that standard, into the kingdom of heavens. That, we find, is the overlay of the reality of the Sermon on the Mount. And this was an astounding thing. And the question would have been, I would have had and have today, I can see that I would have had today, had I not had the history of nearly 50 years to, to examine, I was, how can a believer in him walk in such righteousness. You know, the difficulty they all had was walking in the laws of Moses. And here now, this one stands up and calls to a higher standard of righteousness in order to inherit the kingdom of heavens than the one that they had been trying to do and knew that they were failing in. Well, some that were sincere of heart knew they were failing in. Others had thought presumptuously that they were walking in the high standard of righteousness that the Mosaic law had set before them. What the question is, would then have been in their hearts, is how could we possibly walk in such righteousness? Such righteousness that has put the standard of adultery on a complete another level that goes beyond just the act into the very thought life. How, how is it that we can walk in this kind of righteousness? And he has taken every line, every, every law that is related there, that it is written, he has raised it to a different and higher standard. Not relieving any of the responsibility of the Mosaic law, but increasing. How is it that we could possibly walk in this righteousness? And well, the answer is only in the discovery uh, of him. It's really what he points to, isn't it? Isn't he really pointing to himself when he says, it is written, but I say unto you? He, he's taking this on himself. He's not talking. Don't, you're, he's actually saying you can mull around and you can t continue to follow Mosaic law if you wish. But if you want to inherit the things of the kingdom, the heavens, the ruling and authority, if you want to be a part of my bride, then you must be in me. No longer in Moses, but in me. Now this, this is a difficult thing to, to grasp. Uh, his disciples are trying to get a hold of that, but that's what he's pointing towards. So it's only in the discovery of him as, how, as now he begins filling the Mosaic law with meaning to its fullest, culminating on the earth, on the earth culminating at the cross. 
It began with John. Right? This, this message of Jesus Christ began with John. John was outside the Mosaic Law. Christ was appoint, uh, had been appointed, as was John, the conveyor of a new covenant. John was the precursor. He was the friend. Uh, he was the bridegroom's friend. And so this, this new covenant understanding in him was a, a covenant that was to be the infilling, the filling up to the full of what the Mosaic law had presented to the Israelites of old. What, what were these meaning? What is the meaning of the leaven? What is the meaning of the blood sacrifices? What is the meaning of all these things? The keeping of the Sabbath, etc. The meanings are all found in Christ. Moses wrote of me. Roses, Moses wrote of me. All the things of Moses are pointing toward me. I am him who he wrote of. So it's in me that you may find this standard of righteousness that will carry you into the authority and the, the possession of the kingdom of heavens. In this historical setting, the impasse being the continuance in Moses or in him. That's the impasse. That's, that's the place that Jesus brings his disciples at the Sermon on the Mount. He brings them to an impasse. Will you, will you continue in following after the law of Moses? Trying to find this righteousness that I am demanding of you? There, or will you follow me? In him only may we now have the hope of fulfillment. The hope of fulfillment. That's the word that needs to be used, is hope. The Sermon on the Mount is setting before us the hope of our salvation. It's the fulfilling of our being saved. It's the fullness of saved, meaning salvation. It's the complete atonement that goes beyond eternal life to eternal reward and eternal glory. There's salvation, not an eternal life. And what Jesus holds forth to his disciples is eternal glory. Glory. And that is something that we should hope in. It's an incentive. Hope is an incentive. When I, when I have said to my sons, you know, if you do these things, I will give you your $5 allowance. It was the hope. But they knew that their, that their hope was contingent upon doing those things. They had no hope outside of that fulfilling. They had no right. They could not press me as a right. I am your son, therefore you owe me an allowance. They couldn't press that. That wouldn't work. No, that bed needs to be made. That needs to be done. That needs to be done. And if you do that, I'll give you $5 at the end of the week. Their hope was in that $5. Their hope, they knew I was good for it. They didn't think for a moment that I was lying. They just simply thought to themselves, now what do I have to do here? How can I attain that? So hope is the right word here. And it is, this is this incentive that Christ sets before his disciples in the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapter I will reward you in the kingdom of heavens if, if you rise to the standard of righteousness that I set before you today. And it's a standard of righteousness that far exceeds the scribe and the Pharisees' righteousness. This is an incentive to achieve something possible for those that first must be born again, that first must be justified in faith. Hope is not faith. These three things abide, right? Faith, hope, and love, right? 
The greatest of these is love. Faith is something different than hope. Hope is not faith. Faith is resting in something God has already given us. I have faith that I have already received Christ as, as my salvation in eternal life. For he is my Savior and he paid that propitiation price unto God. He, as Scott said, has taken on the flesh. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man who has died for me, my eternal life, that I might escape eternal death. That's faith. I claim that because it is already given to me. It has been given to me. Now, I, I receive it. I take it as mine. But what Christ is speaking of here is not of something of faith, but of something of hope. Then once the faith is established, once you have received justifying faith, once you have received that that God has gifted you, now there is this promise that's set before us. Hope, faith is resting in something God has already given us. Hope is striving for something we may achieve in him. And I will use that word striving intentionally because it is the word that it that Jesus uses in Luke 13, and it's the word that Paul, I believe, used in Hebrews chapter 3. It's a striving. It's a working out. It's a fighting. It's a fighting for. So this hope is set before us, but it's, it's a hope that can only be attained by striving, working. I received right, a righteousness in Jesus in justifying faith. But he's held out to me and an additional righteousness that once attained to will have a reward in the kingdom of heavens. To seek first the kingdom of God is to live one's life accordingly. Now you'll forgive me that I don't read all the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapters, but I, you are aware that in this somewhere was this this thought conveyed to his disciples from Christ, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. Preceding that was take no thought. Well, what I'm suggesting to you is that to seek first the kingdom of God is to live one's life accordingly. That's striving. In hope, and in anticipation of being a part of the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, there's nothing that has incentivized me to God more than the understanding that God has held out a promise to me that I might receive the kingdom of heavens, a reward in the kingdom of heavens. Nothing has motivated me more in my life. Nothing has motivated me more in my Christian walk since I have seen that it is something that God has asked of me, has promised to me a reward, has set before me a hope, and it, it, it is inspiring me, it is calling me. It's not something that I think that I have attained unto, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. But I press forward, I strive daily that I might attain unto that high calling. A hope set before us and rightly discerned will protect from the lies of Satan. How so? Well, it is the helmet of our salvation. The helmet is that that, that, that comes over the mind. It covers the mind. Hope renews the mind. It's, it keeps the mind. It allows the mind to cast down every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Hope realized, rightly discerned, will protect us from the thoughts and the ambitions of the world. You will not have your hope on the world if your hope is in heaven. In the heaven's reward. You, you won't be. You can't, you can't be. It's an impossibility to have your hope set here and your hope set there. 
Many think their hope's set in there, but they're, actually their hope is here. But if you rightly discern hope as it is presented here in the Sermon on the Mount, then you will not have those prevailing thoughts, those confusing and darkening thoughts of the importance of the things in this world. You have superseded it with a greater and grander hope. Amen. Amen. And this world, it's, it's not something, it'll protect you from this world and its, its character and its way of thinking. As long as you have your mind set on these heavenly things, these promises set before us here in these three chapters. The obscuring of this hope and thereby the realization of it, our personal realization of it, is the object of these religious lives. The religious lies of this is a nature that we will get magically as we cross over, not, not jump over, but run through the Canaan land in through the Jordan River and, you know, in view death, and that will magically be brought into a state of mind that is conveyed here by Christ in these three chapters. Are you with me? Do you understand what I just said? That naturally, that there is a, there is a uh, over view in Christendom, uh, uh, probably a pervading view that says that when you die, you will attain unto these types of character, characteristics that are listed out here by Jesus in these chapters. It's not something that you can attain to or hey, there is even any, any possibility of you gaining or having or getting these kinds of righteousness here on this earth. And it is because of this hope, it is because of the hope that is set before us in a standard of righteousness that can be attained here on the earth that Satan fights religiously with views that are religious to keep you from realizing that hope on the earth. If you don't have that hope on the earth, you'll not have that hope in the, in the heavens. If you haven't realized the hope on the earth, you'll not realize the manifestation of that hope in the heavens. So it is to that point, to your hope in these things, that Satan devises many of his religious lies. Such as, you can't attain under this type of righteousness on the earth. It is a standard that Christ is mentioning just in passing that you'll attain to when you get on the other side. That's, that's the biggest purveyor right there of a lie. That's the biggest religious lie to package up these three chapters and push away any kind of responsibility or accountability that Christ was applying to you and I as his disciple. That's the reality there. It is the object of religious lies. For it is by this hope that one purifies himself in this world. Huh? Is that right? Is that scriptural? Yes, it is the hope. This hope in these things, promises of Christ to be wrought in your lives in your walk here that purifies you and qualifies you for the for the receiving of the promise or reward in the kingdom of heavens. So if he can steal away or he can obscure the hope, then he effectively has stopped you from attaining unto the reward of the kingdom of heavens. What's he care? Well, it quite a bit matters to him because it is from there that he rules and reigns. And it is you in your hope and as you manifest that hope in your walk on the earth that qualifies you to take his place in the kingdom of heavens. Revelation chapter 13. 
It's a, you then are disqualified if you do not work out this hope in your life here, this standard of righteousness. If you do not, then you're disqualified from being caught up if you're alive and resurrected if you're dead in the first resurrection into that heavenly place from whence Satan is cast out for now the second time. First, from the heavens, the third heaven, he was cast out, down to the heavenly realm that he now lives, rules, and reigns from, that heavenly realm just above the earth, the first heavens. And then, then in the 13th chapter of Revelation, he is again cast down from that place to this earth. Woe, woe, woe are to those who inhabit the earth at that time, for he knoweth his time is short. It is to that casting out down and that casting out that this hope is focused on. The hope of your inheritance in the heavenly kingdom above the earth where he now rules and reigns when Christ comes to that heavenly realm catching up those that are upon the earth and thus battle against Satan and they cast him down to the earth. You have been excluded from a participant in that event. Because you had no hope and you therefore developed none of the characteristics of the, the righteousness which Christ is commanding and demanding of you brought to bear, bear here in the 5th and 6th and 7th chapters of Matthew. That's the reality. That's the beginning and the end of the story as it relates to the gifts and the prize of the kingdom of heavens. This is, this is that embarking place and the disembarking place. Page two. Remember my Paul Harvey. <laughs> when I was on that tractor out there in the Kansas wheat fields, I was listening to Paul Harvey every noon. I'd listen to every, just couldn't wait till he came on. As most of the actual commandments of Jesus are self-explanatory, you know, all these commandments from the first half of chapter 5 through the end of chapter 7, commandments with characteristics that should be attained unto, they're fairly self-explanatory. So we focus more on the lying spirits that reason their way, reason away their intended meanings. So I'm going to look at it from behind the scenes a little bit more and say, these are the things God says, and here's what Satan says. Hath God really said? And, and it is in those deceiving lies of hath God really said that most Christians walk and live and have their very being. <laughs> they, don't have, they don't walk and live and have their being in Christ. They are in the spirit. They walk and live and have their being in religious lies. And therefore they think they're in a good place and therefore they haven't received because they think they have. Almost all Christians are told by lying spirits and therefore see themselves as saved, wholly, completely, W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly, completely saved, spirit, soul, and body, with little or nothing needed to be exercised beyond their initial salvation. They believe that since they are eternally saved and cannot lose that salvation, therefore essentially, the secret thought conveyed is that they may live more or less as they choose in full assurance of grace and mercy with nothing necessary beyond their declaration of Jesus as a Savior, as their Savior, without making Him Lord in any manner, or shape, or form. And on that justified only basis, believe themselves do the blessings of God. The Beatitudes, the 28th chapter, of Deuteronomy, any blessings that you could possibly find from front to back, they believe because they've received Jesus as their Savior that they are due. And that here and in the hereafter. I'm to be blessed here and I'm to be blessed there because Jesus is my Savior. That's because the deceiving spirits, the lying spirits, have taken the truce that are easily discernible here in these chapters and obscured them to our thinking and made them us 
we polarize to one of those four or more different kinds of views of these true, this true truth. Only we, we perceive it to be under this category, or that category, or this. all of them re relieving us of the truth of the responsibility to become, have a righteousness, to have the righteousness that Christ is demanding and commanding of us. He's, he's done a good job of it. I'm, 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 I'm sure 99 out of 100. I'm more than that. <laughs> he's, he's been very successful. He began by persecution, he did, he, he, by just annihilation. But that didn't work so good because every time he mowed the grass, it comes up thicker. So he, he changed his strategy to the same strategy that he used with the Midianites and, and he, the same strategy that he used through Balaam. And he decided to work within to corrupt them, us as Christians and brought in the brought in the uh, religious lies that first begun in the first and second century. We've, we, uh, Christian, they have perceived neither clear understanding nor necessity of the commands from Jesus, nor therefore the promise of the prize for having made him Lord of their lives other than the blessings on the earth. This is essentially the same perspective that that the Jewish nation had of God. To tithe or attend services, you know, go to the temple, whatever. To tithe or attend services or exercise a prayer, any of these things are but means that they might receive added tangible blessings upon their earthly walk in their lives. To go along with the anticipated in eternal bliss in heaven. They always took that at, for granted. After they died, they will receive that eternal bliss, that promise. The promise be it of Abraham, the promise be of Jesus. We, we are of the seed of Abraham. Well, we are the seed of Jesus Christ. Both, both have presumed something that, that's not a reality. It's not a reality. It's only a lying spirit. It's only a spirit who has obscured the truth to your eyes and have convinced you of something that, that is less, uh, less obligating you in covenant. Hath God really said. He didn't really mean that. This is what he really meant. This is the righteousness which was referred to by Christ as that of the scribes of the Pharisees. That's right there in the fifth chapter, about the 20th verse. Oh, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Oh, I'll explain that away, will you? Well, I will. That's in one of those four. Will you believe this? Will you believe that? Will you believe this? Or will you believe that? That's how I, that's how I get away with that. That's how I get away from the accountability that Jesus clearly put before his disciples. And then unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no way, no case, no way enter into the kingdom of heavens. How can you say it more clearly or definitively? It is, it is a scary proposition. It should have been. It should be. And then the, verse that I, the verses that I'd like to finish up on in, that are in the seventh chapter in this Sermon on the Mount, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heavens. Anytime you see the word heaven in Matthew, it is plural, heavens. But he that doeth the will of my Father, in the Greek, which is in heaven, heavens, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Works being understood here as, as the display of righteousness. Haven't we done many works? Oh, isn't our, doesn't our righteousness raise up to that standard that you set before us to inherit? 
And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and what? And doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. If Curse was here, I'd sing that song. The rock cannot be moved, or the rock won't be moved, or I, I can't help but think of him every time I read that verse. I can hear his voice. Which showed, showed a wise man that which, which would have built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew. That's life, all right? That's life. And beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. These are the dead works of righteousness. These works that they brought before the Lord as their offering, that they carried before him at the judgment seat, were their works, but their works were dead works. They weren't living works. What do we mean, dead work? They were without spiritual meaningfulness. They're not particularly painful. They are such as the Lord referred to as, these all give of their abundance. You remember when they were bringing the offering to the temple? This works, these works are, are dead works. There was no particular pain with them. Pain relating to the flesh. Pain related to me, self, mine. When Christ speaks of building our house on rock or sand, here in the Sermon on the Mount, he refers to saved Christians building on his righteousness, their righteousness. By keeping his commandments which alone will ensure the inheritance of the kingdom of heavens. As opposed to someone who is mistakenly building a righteousness that will be disqualified, that based upon the righteousness depicted and promoted of the scribes and the Pharisees. We are the seed of Abraham. We, we tithe every week. We tithe down to the very corners in our field. We did it all. We all know that you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. We know that this righteousness that is being purveyed by the law of Moses is insufficient. Because the law of Moses has to be kept in every jot and tittle. If you offend in one, you offend in all. That pretty well excludes everybody but one. So your, your righteousness, that you are involved in and in bringing of your dead works to establish before me, will fall upon his ears and will fall upon yours as depart from me. Because your standard of righteousness did not exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Page 3. Those lives that are built upon the rock, which is the complete whole doctrine of Christ, not just, just that part that we want to pick out, I'm saved because I believe in Jesus and I have eternal life. And I can say it a, a, a thousand times and not said it enough, there's not very much merit in that. There's not very much merit in receiving a gift that God has given you. So we have to have the whole complete 
doctrine of Christ, the full atonement, the full meaning of his salvation, that to bring sons to God. And those that are built upon this rock, the whole counsel of the gospel will survive all the trials and the temptations of the world. It will survive. It will stand. It will not falter. It will not fail. It will not blow away. It will not bury under. Those whose lives are built upon the rock of Christ will be the bride of Christ. The ones chosen out from among the merely saved at the judgment seat of Christ to enter the kingdom of heavens. The Lord speaks in the Sermon on the Mount to those already eternally saved. Those who would now, this, at this moment, be his disciples, disciplined ones, heeding his words by keeping his laws. Those who would inherit the kingdom of heavens by doing the will of the Father on the earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth. How? By doing the will of the Son. All things have been put under the Son's authority. To these, to us, called to be disciples, he explains the different foundations in chapter 7. You know the foundations, right? Sand and rock. Well, it brings to my mind the two foundations. There's two foundations, but I, I see four foundations. Two, two are similar and two are similar. These are the foundations by, on which those that are saved, this, those that would be disciples, those that have a hope, these are the foundations they may build on. You may build on the smitten rock. The smitten rock, right? You remember in Exodus, the smitten rock. You may build on that rock. Or, you may build on the foundation stone. You remember that foundation stone? The new, the new scripture? The scripture for the foundation stone, Jesus Christ. Or, you, you could build on the smiting rock. You remember Daniel 2? Daniel 2 is that rock that was hewn out of the mountain without hands, that fell upon the nations and ground them to dust. You, you, can, you can build your house underneath the smiting rock. That's on the sand. Or you can build your house under the thread of the stumbling stone. Remember? Christ, the resurrection, the Messiah Jesus was a stumbling stone of the house of the Jews, right? To build on the rock is characterized by dying to self. Fall on the rock, not let the rock fall on you. He that falls on the rock can count on the rock. This is the dying to self that's characterized in that she gave all she had. They gave out of her, their abundance. There was no pain in that. There was no suffering. There was no character building. There was no death to self. There was no flesh smell burning on the altar of God. It was all the smell of living flesh. But with her, she gave it all. I mean, that, that was just so... Poignant. Yeah, when you... I mean, to me, the older I get in Christianity, I don't... There's just certain scriptures that that's the ones I butt up against. And I, that's one of them. Like, you know, take no thought for your life. None. Doesn't say, hey, be smart. Figure stuff out. Mm -hmm. It says, don't take a single thought for your soul. And, you know, hate your soul in this, in this life. And it's like I'm just looking at Jesus and, and no wonder we can't get further 
Because this is what He's saying to us. He is saying, follow Me. Leave this place and follow Me. And you know what? We need the strippings that we get. If we don't get those, you can forget it. You will, you will love Egypt. You will love the desert. It, it's going to have to become odious and painful to the degree that we will leave. Otherwise, we won't. Right. We will. We will prefer slavery. We love. We're like they're just a picture. Of, they're just a natural picture of spiritual things. They longed for the slavery. They wanted to go back. And thank God that the waves get over our heads, that there's no food here, no water here, no comfort here, no nothing here. Because if He doesn't do that, we're not going to move. We're not going to go. We're going to be like the Pharisees. We're going to be hypocrites. We're going to be liars. Yep. It, it's the same dynamic as the Israelites. The very same exact. How are we to defeat those ites? They're 10 foot tall. It's the same thing when Jesus says, I say, the word says, but I say. Moses said, but I say. Wow. It was hard enough here. It was hard enough in, in, in Egypt. How, how is it we're going to go into the promised land with this kind of righteousness required of us? In me, in him, in, in me. That's the only way you're going to go in. The only way you're going to inherit. And it's not in presumption. And it's not in apathy. But it is in works. It is in you applying, yielding yourself. Having a new heart. A different heart. A heart of Joshua. A heart of Caleb. She gave all she had. She gave. To, there was no hurt left. She gave all, all she had. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't require any more of her. She gave it all. That's what Christ is saying to us. You can't retain it. You can't go to the place before it gets painful and stop and expect to inherit the things of the heavens. Because what, what qualifies you to rule is that you were able to rule. Come on, let's rule. All of this is about this painful battle against the flesh within. That's where we're focused. That's where Christ focuses us in all these words. He puts it right on us. The onus is right there in you. The battle within. It's the dynamic energized by being regenerated. Your conscience was only yeah, a little thing, hardly alive, just barely pulse, just barely beating. Hardly could see any aurora or the red around it at all. It was almost dead when he came in and rebirthed, enlivened your conscience and made it a throbbing, beating, living organism in you, your spirit. He made it alive. That is, that is now the battle he's created in you. You were really only one. You were only one, but now you're twins. Now there's two wrestling in your womb. The flesh and the spirit. This is where Christ is pointing us, right here. You must, by the spirit, little ass, big ass, overcome this flesh within you. This flesh that wants to be dominate and wants to be ruler and wants a self. You can do it. You can do it in me, he says. So it is in this, in this dynamic that has been energized by you being born again. Saved from eternal life. death, that's a fact. Saved from eternal death. Praise the Lord for the gift. You can't strive for that, can you? Can you strive for the gift of eternal life? What's Ephesians 2 say? What's, what's Romans 6 say? You cannot obtain unto eternal life through works. It's a gift of God. Let no man boast. <laughs> that, that was a gift. You got the gift. Eternal life. Praise the Lord. You can't strive for the gift. <laughs> it's a gift. It's without striving. But here we have set before us the promise of 
striving, working, cooperating, yielding, dying, crucifying. Let's, let's look at Luke 13 real quick. I, I don't think that I have really, I shouldn't just assume. Luke 13, verse 24. No, verse 23. 13, 23. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive. This is an answer to to if there's a few to be saved or a lot to be saved. Just tell us, Lord, is, is, what kind of chance? What's our odds? Two out of ten? Eight out of ten? One out of ten? What's our odds, Lord? He says, he didn't answer it. He says, strive. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. You know, that, the, the gate being restricted means you can't bring anything in with you. You see, you see it, it, it's only, the gate is only wide enough that you can slide through sideways. Because if, if it was wide enough going forward, you could carry stuff on your back. But when you have to go in like this, yeah, anything. I don't care. There's nothing that gets by that gate. You're not going to carry in nothing of your... Uh, and that's what's narrow. It's saying narrow is that gate. You know, you only make it through there because you strive to get rid of all extrinsic kinds of flesh. You've gotten rid of all that stuff. Who was it that tells the story? It was just a beautiful story. They said, the Lord said, come follow me. And they said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. Can I bring this? And he nodded. He, Can I bring this? Yeah. He nodded. He, Can I bring this? Yeah. Come on. And so they started following Christ. And he went mile after mile after mile. Pretty soon this stuff just got really heavy. And he just let go of this. Now he kept following Christ, following Christ. And later, I just got so tired. I got to get rid of this. And the Lord knew all along. He knew that you can bring it, but you ain't going to be able to get there with it all this baggage. That's the, that's the story of our walk here that Christ is laying on us. He said, He's saying the only way you're going to be able to do this is in me. You got to stay in me. You got to let the spirit of God and the conscience. You got to follow it, and it'll strengthen you and it'll empower you as you will to do my will. This is the this is the war that we're engaged in, and this is the war that Christ put us in when He rebirthed. He gave us eternal life, but there's something yet beyond the eternal life that's called the salvation of the soul that's set before us all. Thank God for the gift of life. But that's not where he intended for us to stay. So here in the 13th chapter of Luke, we see it's that he said, as it relates to, are there a lot of people saved or a few people saved? How many? He didn't even answer that question of eternal life. He speaks to the kingdom. The straight gate is into the kingdom, not into eternal life. <laughs> Listen, the broad is the way into the eternal life. Thank God, broad is the way into eternal life. Is there anyone doubt? Is there anyone that doubts how many people are born again constantly on the face of the earth? I mean, people are born again, born again, born again, born again. That is not the point of God. That's not the purpose of salvation. That's not what He intended. That's not what He meant when there was a gate. Praise God, the gate to eternal life is broad and wide. He's benevolent. <laughs> oh, you ain't heard this anywhere else, have you? That's the reality. Thank God all of us are born again. And not only us, but many people we know are born again and are not going to eternal death. But narrow is the way to, to these promises. Narrow is the way into the kingdom of heavens. Narrow, wide is the way of scribes and Pharisees. Wide is that way. But narrow is the way into the kingdom of heavens. To rule and reign with me, it requires this greater righteousness. In this entering in, those that seek to enter in, those that strive to enter in are not striving to enter into eternal life, are they? They're striving to enter into the kingdom of heavens. And it says... 
There's many that will not be able to. Why? Because they didn't strive legally. <laughs> you deal with legally. Christ said to run the race legally, right? If you, don't run, if you run the race illegally, if you don't run it in Christ, you will not enter in. So this battle within is that d dynamic energized by being regenerated or saved. Saved from eternal death. It's a gift that no man may strive for. It is by faith and not works. Ephesians 2. A righteousness imputed to build upon this are the laws of Jesus given. And by keeping this righteousness is imparted by the works of righteousness. What? <laughs> I'm saying that justifying, being born again, is there is a righteousness that's imputed to you. It's imputed. It means it's a gift. You didn't earn it. But the righteousness that we are striving for is the righteousness that is working out our own salvation with fear and trembling, striving to enter in the narrow gate, striving to attain unto the righteousness of Christ as it relates to character, not as it relates to eternal life. This is, this, what's in view here is Paul's buffeting his body daily. I buffet my body daily lest I be found a reprobate. How could he be found a reprobate? A reprobate as it relates to the kingdom of heavens, not a reprobate as it relates to justifying in faith for eternal life. It is that that he strove to and buffeted his body for, that he might attain unto the high calling of the prize of the inheritance of Jesus Christ in the first resurrection, Philippians chapter 3. It's 1 Corinthians 9 in running the race, the striving to enter into his rest of Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> Works of righteousness, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. The faith more precious than gold, Peter says. Refined in the winds and the storms of life are strictly limited to an internal battle of spirit, little s, big s, versus flesh. Romans 6 through 8 explains that dynamic. Building on the foundation rock is receiving the truth, Jesus Christ, His words, and is a life consecrated to living in the Spirit, little s, big s, and crucifying the flesh in accordance with the laws of Christ as revealed here on the Sermon on the Mount. Are you with me? The law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. It is here Jesus expresses the internal battle in descriptive terms of cutting off or plucking out members of the carnal, carnal body. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. Good gracious, I did it. My four, four eyes. <laughs> I plucked out my four eyes. They do offend me. And then the cutting off of the hand. If it offends you, the cutting it off. This, this is that which Christ is referring to as the, the character or the righteousness that is required for the inheritance of the kingdom of heavens. How can you understand that? How can you find, how, what meaning do you put in it when Christ says, if your eye pluck, offends you, pluck it out? How, how do you apply, what meaning what does, he, what does he mean by that? If my hand offends me, cut it off. Better that a part of me goes into Ghana, into the fire, than all of me. There's only, the only the way that you can apply that is from a spiritual context in that he is significantly putting value on the on the battle of the spirit with the flesh. There is a, is a, is a huge uh, schasm between the two. And there's a necessity that there's such a need for war that he, that he puts it in such means and terms that 
that we have hard a time in comprehending the, the idea of if my eye offends me, pluck it out. But that's just how difficult it is in flesh and spirit. For you to separate yourself from your flesh is as difficult as plucking out your own eye. Try it. Am I lying here? <laughs> it's just as difficult. And that is what Christ knew. But he is still suggesting, nevertheless, as difficult as it is, pluck that thing out. You want to inherit the kingdom of heavens? Pluck it out. Cut it off. <laughs> As I said, this works of righteousness is the gold and the silver and the precious stones of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Building on the foundation rock is the receiving the truth of Jesus' words and, and a life consecrating to living in the spirit and crucifying the flesh. This constitutes the internal battle against the flesh after being saved. With an exclusive new covenant empowering, he is with you and shall be in you. John 14, I believe. He is with you and he shall be in you. The Holy Spirit. Building a life on His commands is working out the salvation of our souls. That is to say that we might qualify for the millennial kingdom of Christ to rule and reign with Him through the glorious infilling of the first resurrection. All should know that only saved will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We all should know that, right? Only the saved stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'm, and I'm not talking about the white throne judgment seat. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ that all must stand before. All Christians must stand before. And be judged for what? We be judged for our works after we are saved. Is that right? Well, example after example, the 13th chapter, Luke I think goes on to say it, but also the... Romans 14, 2 uh, uh, talks about our standing before the judgment seat. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, Revelation 22. All of these point toward our works. The foundation we build upon, right? The foundation we build upon, sand or rock, is exposed at the judgment seat of Christ. When do we know? When do we know whether, we, whether our foundation was built on Christ or if it was built on, on a religious lies? Well, for certainly, definitively, we will know at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Intuitively, we may know before. I think intuitively, we all know whether we're... I think Christ's voice is loud enough to get by all the noise, the white noise of the, of the lies. But we don't want to hear that. Later, Lord, later. Later is the way we approach that. All should know then that we're saved. There's only the ones that stand before the, the judgment seat of Christ and they'll be judged on whether or not they built it on, on the sand or on, or on the rock. The house being built on the sand is the wood, the hay, and the stubble. Of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The house built on the sand is the wood, hay, and the stubble of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The Christian's building material of religious dead works, legalism, self-works, without the works of the Spirit, little s and big S. Without the painful death of flesh, our religion is perfunctory rote ritual. With having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The power of what? The power of the Spirit, little s, big S. And Christ said, from such, turn away. From those who have only the form of godliness, we are to turn away. That's similar to separate yourself in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You separate yourself from those who are engaged in these sins. And even do not eat with them. Do not fellowship with them. We're not to fellowship or or have 
uh, a fellowship around Christ with Christians, not with the world, but with Christians. We're not to have fellowship with those that have only the form of godliness. That's 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 scary, isn't it? I don't know who I'd fellowship with. <laughs> I, I know that this. Well, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying out in the in the world, in Christendom and in the world, it, it would be difficult to find companionship around Christ. Because of of their lack of godliness due to the fact that they don't think that there is a power that can bring them into this godliness. They deny it. There is no power that can take you into this type of godliness, this type of righteousness that Christ is requiring of his followers. Wow. Okay. All right. So that's kind of like saying there's no way we could beat those giants in the promised land, huh? I mean, it would be impossible for me to hand-to-hand -hand combat overcome that. Yeah. Impossible. That's right. And, and, but that's how we look at it, isn't it? Isn't how Christendom looks at it in their strength? Yeah. Yep. They, they don't know how to die to self to obtain unto his strength, so they only live under their own strength. And so we're to, we're to, to, not, we're separate, we're to separate ourselves from them, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We then have no distinctiveness. That, there's no distinctiveness. And you, you, know, you lose your savor when you, when you join yourself at the hip with these. We, we have no distinctiveness. For after all these things do the Gentiles <coughs> seek. Now, this is in the sixth chapter of, of uh, Matthew where he says, take no thought saying, what will you eat, what will you drink, what will you wear. And he says, the Lord knows you have all the need of these things. But these things are the things that Gentiles seek after. Well, we're not Gentiles, and we're not Jews, and we're not supposed to be. We're supposed to be the new man, right? Ephesians chapter 2. Neither Jew nor Gentile. We're the new nation. God is called out. We're a people for his namesake. Uh, Acts chapter 15. These things the Gentiles seek after. What is it? What is he saying to us? These things the world seeks after. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Matthew 6, 32. It is but the religious foundation of sand that will not withstand the tests and the trials brought to bear upon it here at the judgment seat in the hereafter. You know, this, this kind of character that I'm speaking of, that character that was built on sand, do, uh, built according to religious lies, won't withstand the winds and trials and tests of this world, much less will it stand the judgment seat in the hereafter. It won't. <laughs> the great fall of the house built on the sand is representative of the loss of the inheritance of the kingdom of heavens. Great is its fall, built on sand, religious lies perfunctory rote ritual, those things. Those things that Christendom is built upon. Today's modern day Christendom. The great fall of the house built on the sand is representative of the loss of the inheritance of the kingdom of heavens, the judgment fire that ravages the house of 1 Corinthians 3.15. You remember? It's the Guyana fire of Matthew Chapter 5, verses 22, 29, 30, chapter 7, and 13 and 19. Do you remember any of those scriptures? One is that if you call your brother a fool, you're in danger of Raqqa or, or Gaina of fire. Another one is later on in the seventh chapter speaks about cut it off this and better that it go into the hell fire. Another one is that if, you know, in the seventh chapter of Matthew, you guys are looking at me like I was. No, <laughs> like what is he talking about? I'm talking about in Matthew chapter 5 that Herod's kingdom is that judgment fire that rages through the house of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm speaking to you about that's the same fire that is being conveyed by Jesus as the potential for disciples who have refused to build their house on the rock. And that this fire related that we would be subject to is mentioned at least three times in these three chapters. And the first time is uh, 
The first time is in verse 22, 522. Whosoever say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. He's speaking to the disciples. He's not talking about eternal death. But he is talking about a place of torment. You're in danger. You're endangering yourself. Not only have you lost the inheritance of the kingdom of heavens because you have refused to build your house on the rock, but greater is that fall even than that because you were foolish enough to not love your brethren and to call them foolish. Second of all is those who take, those th- uh, take thought uh, uh, in, uh, created in their own lives a, a nature or practice of fornication. That's what he relates to plucking your eye out and cutting your hand off and, and casting it into the fire. And then the third part I'm looking for it's verse nine, chapter 7, verse 19. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So, you know, those three examples are three that I, I don't know, maybe even more, but I know there's at least three examples of a fire that relate, have in view, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where it relates to the, the one that be, will be saved. His, his works will be judged, but if there's wood, hay, and stubble, he will be judged as through fire. And so there's a fire, John 15, verse 1. There's a fire for not abiding in the vine. There's a fire because the husband cuts off the dead branches that refuse to bring forth life and faithfulness, and he has cast them into a fire. And these are not those eternal fires, and this is not the lake of fire, but this is that fire represented by Guiana. It's a purging fire. It's a fire that you chose to go through as opposed to purge yourself. He's the author and the finisher. He'll purge you if you won't purge you. And you purge you, but you'll re- you lose the reward of you purging you. That's what I meant when I was saying that. These are those that have refused the wisdom of how to build the temple of God. These have refused the wisdom on how to build the the temple of God. I don't need to do that to build the temple of God. God hath not really said that. To build this temple? Nah. All I need to do is say Jesus is Lord. That's all I got to do. I, I believe that and that's all I got to do. There's no other accountability beyond that. That'll work. That'll get me in. That'll get me into the promises. I'll receive all that God has. The result of refusing the wisdom on how to build the temple of God is Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Whoever hears these things of mine doth them, I will liken him to a wise man. Everyone that heareth these things of mine and doth them not shall be likened unto a fool, a foolish man. With 1 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. What day? The day of the judgment seat of the Lord, the judgment seat of Christ that you and I will stand before. We'll declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Every man's work, what sort it is. The wind and the trial of life on the house that's built on what? Sand or rock. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet as so by through fire. By fire means through fire in the Greek. Know you not that you are the temple of God? That's the next verse, in case you haven't read that far in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The next verse is, know you not? What? You're arguing and fighting about these carnal things. Are you not just yet carnal? Have you not built a house in you that, can, that we could judge not as carnal? Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? And that you are to be building a house that it would be fit for Him? Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Listen, is there any less need for the Holy Spirit than there was on the day of Pentecost? No. There's not any less the need for the abiding power of the Holy Spirit in your and my life than in the disciples' life on the day of Pentecost. Amen. I need Him more than they needed Him. They had a personal acquaintance with the Lord. I have none. 
save justification. I need the Holy Spirit. I need to build him a temple that he can dwell in. I need not to grieve him. I need to establish his, his will, his right to be within me. <clears throat> if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Woo! That's that purging. That's that fire that every man will be subject to at the judgment seat of Christ. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Those Christians Jesus referred to in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, who have founded their lives upon the rock of Jesus Christ are likened unto wise men. Those who have founded their lives upon the sands of the religious works of self are likened unto foolish men. Reminding us of the wise and foolish virgins of Matthew chapter 25. Some had oil. No, they all had oil. All ten had oil. Or did just some of them have oil? Tell me. They all had oil. But five were wise and five were foolish. Five had more oil. More Holy Spirit. They had hewn out in the rock of their self a capacity for more of the oil of the Holy Spirit. They had beyond that the sealing of the Holy Spirit. They had the infilling and the baptism and the continual infilling and baptism of the Holy Ghost. They were found with oil. They were wise. They built their house out of gold, silver, and precious stones. They built it on the rock. This parable teaches that the five foolish versions had only one portion of oil in their lamps thus revealing that they were justified or saved. The five wise virgins had two portions of the oil. The first, that oil that accompanied the faith expressed in the saving atonement of Jesus Christ, and the second was that infilling portion that the five wise virgins carried with them in vessels, thus showing that they were not only saved, but also had a double portion of the Spirit of God that gives knowledge of the kingdom and the power to build. Hence, their lives were founded upon a rock. This parable informs us that at the judgment seat, the wise will go into the marriage while, lambs supper while the foolish will try in vain to obtain the extra oil that will be needed to enter. The door will be shut to the heavenly marriage and they will be left outside crying for the Lord to open the door to them. The foolish in this parable represent most of Christendom who will fail to inherit the kingdom. The wise represent a very small portion of Christendom who at the judgment seat of Christ will enter the kingdom, the kingdom of heavens, the first resurrection, that great reward of prize that Paul referred to, the one that won the race, who ran the race legally. When a believer allows the old nature and the soul to rule over his life, he produces dead works of unrighteousness. Not dead works of righteousness, dead works of unrighteousness. When he submits to the Holy Spirit to rule over his life through his spirit, he produces works of righteousness. Romans 8, 1 through 5. He that abides or minds the things of the Spirit walks in the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not in the law, the spirit of the law, which brings death. To seek righteousness, Christians must strive, seek to give all control of their lives to Christ by observing his words and asking Him for the Holy Spirit's empowerment. I give you another comforter. You ask of, ask of the Father, and He shall sin. Our minding the things of the Spirit, little s, big S, is walking in the Spirit, little s, big S, of life in Christ that sets me free from the obligation of the law of Moses and the workings of the curse for not fully walking in its demands. He will cause us then to remain in the washings of favor. He'll wash our hands and feet that are contaminated in earth, but our whole body will be clean. We will stay in communion and fellowship with him. We will repent of the darkness and the deeds of darkness, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For we will remain in working communion, living communion, kononia with Christ, and thereby fulfill his commandments. We fulfill his commandments. We fulfill his commandments, faithful and fruitful, which is the standard of righteousness needed to inherit the kingdom. The turning away from the desires of this world to the hope 
of the next world. Is that what causes us to strive against our old nature and allows Jesus to be Lord of our lives? And only by striving can we enter into the straight gate. The spiritual Christian's hope is the coming kingdom. The carnal Christian's hope is in his success in this present world. Spiritual Christians have a reverential fear of God and they know He will judge all their works at the judgment seat of Christ. And because of this fear, they are able to receive wisdom. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Thus, as they receive wisdom, which is the double portion of the oil, they become wise. That God through Paul prayed that I pray that you might have a spirit of wisdom and understanding in the knowledge of God. The carnal Christians have no fear of God. They correctly believe they correctly believe that they are saved and cannot lose their they incorrectly believe that they are saved and cannot lose their eternal salvation. They correctly believe, I'm sorry, they correctly believe that they are saved and cannot lose their eternal salvation. They are correct in that. But they incorrectly believe that since they are saved by grace, they will automatically gain all rewards in heavens, no matter how they live here on earth. Amen? Amen. Thank, you for your, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your willing hearts and minds. May God bless your hearts and your willing minds. May He open your hearts that you might know the hope of our salvation, that glorious infilling of the first resurrection in the kingdom of Christ. May, may he answer that prayer in our lives and fulfill it by the indwelling Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Father, forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from our stubbornness. I thank you, Lord, that even in the new covenant, where in the Old Covenant there was not a sacrifice or an offering for willing sin, that in the New Covenant even there is an offering for our willing, confessed sin. And Lord, willingly we sin each day. God, forgive us in the blood of Jesus Christ and help us to continue in the race, to run it, to apply ourselves in our lives and our hearts and our minds toward that goal of attaining into the kingdom of heaven, that promise, that righteousness that Christ himself will empower us and impart in us and through us as we apply our hearts and yield unto the spirit of Christ. Thank you, Father God, for yielded hearts. We present them before, we, before you and we yield our hearts before you and we repent of our sins, and we ask that you would, would establish us again in the race, that we can finish the race strong. And God, in ourselves, we can't kill that giant, but in you, we can do all things. You strengthen us. It's possible. It's not only possible, it's probable, and it's more than probable. It's, it's insurance in you that you are able to do that, that above and beyond and abundantly above, more than we could ask or think. We know that, and that we trust, in that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. We, we trust in you, we believe in you, and we ask you, cleanse us, cleanse our filthy minds, cleanse our carnality, cleanse us from everything that offends the Holy Spirit, and allow him to do the full and complete work of your atonement in us. In Jesus' name I pray. Bless this group, Father. Bless us. Help us. This small, tiny, little, in, insignificant little group. Bless us, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.